Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome again to the new lecture of this course properties of materials. So let's just briefly recap uh, what we did in the last lecture. So in the last lecture we looked at transformation of axes for a strain with the caveat that this is applicable only for for very small strains and the relation was you can calculate if epsilon i j is equal to epsilon i j is equal to uh, l i m l i n into epsilon of m n. So, you can include summation over m summation over m m n n and m n m n n will vary from 1 to 2, 3. So, this is how you can calculate the stresses like you know strains like epsilon 1 prime 1 prime 2 prime 2 prime or epsilon 3 prime 3 prime. You can also calculate epsilon 1 prime 2 prime epsilon 2 prime 3 prime and epsilon 3 prime 1 prime. So, this is all possible to calculate uh, from this and then we also saw that shear stress is related to engineering shear stress is related to mathematical shear stress using this relation. So, epsilon i j is equal to half of gamma i j all right. So, now let us move on to the next topic having introduced the mathematical framework for the relations of stress and strain and transformations uh, of axes. So, the transformation of axes that we are doing for uh, true stress can also be applied for engineering stress or engineering strain. And now, what we will do is that we will look at, look at what is a theory of elasticity. So, we will just introduce the concepts related to the theory of elasticity in this lecture without getting into too many details about it. So, the first thing as we know elastic deformation in materials. is basically a reversible deformation. Okay. So, when you stretch something let us say of length L and when you stretch it to let us say to let us say L plus delta. So, this is upon application of load. Okay. So, this is where you apply the load. So, when you release the load the material gets back to its original dimension. So, basically essentially what happens is that material reverts back to its original dimensions. This is what basically reversible deformation is and most and all materials will show it materials of all kinds show it, but to a different extent. So, if you look at crystalline solids such as such as metals ceramics they show small elastic strains or rather very small elastic strains. Whereas, materials which are polymers especially elastomers show higher elastic strains. 
So not only they show higher elastic strains, it's also that their behavior can also be different. So for example, if you make a plot of elastic strain of uh, uh, of a let us say a crystalline solid sigma versus E. So, this is basically a engineering stress strain plot, engineering stress versus strain plot. So, we have seen what engineering strain, strain is and if you recall engineering stress is P divided by A naught and engineering is and true stresses. So, this is engineering and the true stresses uh, P divided by A i where this is instantaneous area. So, this is the difference. Uh, so, generally for engineering purposes we use engineering strain. So, in solids which are crystalline in nature generally this region the stress strain plot is like this and it continues to so let us say it continues all right. So, it is linear up to a point A and after that nonlinearity sets in and we will see the behavior of this plot later on. So, this region is basically so you can say from O to A it is linear and this is the and the product of area under the curve is basically you can say elastic energy stored which is half of sigma E essentially. However, the magnitude of this elastic strain up to this point let us say E 1 or E naught is very small. Okay, this strain is less than 1 percent and it can be very, very small, extremely small. And so, this is shown by most crystalline solids. Okay. On the other hand, if you look for materials which are rubbery in nature. So, sigma versus E. So, let us say this is for rubber or you can say molecular solids, molecular chain containing materials like plastics, polymers, rubbers, etcetera. In these materials generally the behavior is slight different. So, there is a So, let us say this is point A, this is O. So, O A is nonlinear. So, the behavior is elastic up to this point you have elastic strain. So, let us say this is E naught and this is the area under the curve which is the elastic energy but this is a nonlinear region. So, they show elastic behavior, but it is not linear in nature and this is recoverable. Okay. So, for the linear region in terms of crystalline solids, let us say first, for the linear region we define sigma as E into E, where sigma is the stress engineering stress, this is strain, engineering strain and this proportionality constant you can say sigma is proportional to E and the proportionality constant is called as modulus of elasticity or in exact term it is called as Young's modulus. Okay. This is what it is. The modulus of elasticity is a fundamental property of material. So, this E if you write this in tensorial notation of course, it becomes sigma i j becomes E i j k l small e k l. So, essentially it is a fourth rank 
tensor, but for a lot of practical purposes we just write it in the scalar form. And this E is a fundamental property of the and is related to nature of bonding and we will come to that a little later. It cannot be changed by by processing if composition is the, remains the same. Uh, in general ok. So, you have to make a change in the composition to achieve a change in the uh, modulus of elasticity it is a fundamental property. In general this is true that for a given material if you change its heat treatment schedule you might change its strength, but you may not change its modulus. So, modulus of elasticity can also be determined by So, not only you can determine that by carrying out a stress strain measurement. So, if you carry a uh, basically a stress strain measurement from the slope of linear region you can determine what the modulus of elasticity is, but you can also determine it by, by acoustic methods. Because velocity of sound V in a material is related to modulus in such manner. So, this is velocity of sound this is density and this is modulus. So, essentially uh, the dense the material is higher the density of a material is lesser is the velocity of sound for a given modulus or alternatively you can write this as E is equal to V square into rho. So, if you can measure the velocity of sound in materials you can you can sort of determine the modulus of elasticity by acoustic measurements. There are a few more quantities. So, we can write first of all elastic modulus as Young's modulus as E is equal to sigma divided by small e. There is another quantity called a shear modulus which is defined as G and which is tau divided by gamma. So, this is shear stress, this is shear engineering shear strain or shear strain. There is another quantity called as bulk modulus which is essentially k and this is sigma hydrostatic. So, this is hydrostatic stress divided by fractional volume change. So, this is hydrostatic stress and this is fractional volume change and this stress could be tensile or compressive uh, in case of Young's modulus, in case of shear it is shear stress and again the hydrostatic could be tensile or compressive. So, sigma or sigma hydrostatic could be either tensile or compressive all right. And there is another quantity. So, this is first quantity of importance Young's modulus, second quantity of importance is shear modulus, third quantity of importance is bulk modulus and there is fourth quantity of importance which is for elastic uh, behavior. So, this, this is defined as nu and this nu is equal to ratio of transverse to
to lateral strain which is minus of E y divided by minus of E z. So, this is what these are the four uh, properties that we have and this this is so we say that this is sigma y divided E y divided by E z minus and Poisson's ratio value for generally for metals it is minus of uh, 0.33. Uh, because one of the strains is going to be negative, so negative negative is cancel each other. So, metals it is about 0.33, ceramics is about 0.25 and uh, polymers have a value of nearly 0.4. So, these are sort of benchmarks and you can see that the value of modulus is also in MPA or GPA which is basically Newton per meter square, mega Newton or giga Newtons per meter square. So, basically they follow the same unit as of stress. So, these are four fundamental quantities as far as elastic behavior is concerned, the Young's modulus, the shear modulus, the bulk modulus and the Poisson's ratio. And the plots that we use to measure them are like this, the way they are represented in measurements. So, if you apply a axial stress sigma and measure axial strain E, then the behavior will be like this before it turns nonlinear and up to this point this is so let us say A O A this is linear region within linear region the slope of this part will give you E is equal to sigma divided by small e. So, this is for Young's modulus. The second quantity is shear modulus So, here you apply a shear stress before it turns into nonlinear nonlinearity this is let us say again O A on the y axis we have shear stress tau on the x axis we have shear strain gamma engineering shear strain and the slope of these will be g will be equal to tau divided by gamma and similarly for hydrostatic stress this will be sigma hydrostatic and this is fractional volume change and if you measure the plot, the plot would be something like. So, this would be hydrostatic things would be something like under very heavy pressure let us say pressure vessels or uh, objects that are residing under sea and things like that. So, So, this would be the point of nonlinearity O A and the slope of this. So, this will be again be nonlinear region and this will give you a slope of sigma hydrostatic divided by delta V divided by V naught. So, this is sort of the relation between this is these are the three uh, this is hydrostatic or bulk Let us not write hydrostatic, just write the bulk modulus. So, these are the uh, sort of uh, three things. Now, for elastic material, for isotropic elasticity, we will come to isotropic term in a minute. So, for isotropic elasticity, let us first see what isotropic is. Okay. basically there is no directional dependence of of properties that is properties are same in all directions 
So, here what we mean is that the modulus of material is similar in all directions. So, if you take a cube, let us say, or if you take this bar, the E is in this direction, E in this direction, E in this direction, E in this direction, this direction, that direction, in all the directions the E is same. This could be a fair approximation as far as polycrystalline materials are concerned, but it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a it is assumed to make things simpler, but it could life would be a little harder than that. So, uh, assume that material does not have any dependence of properties on the direction, which means properties are similar in all the directions. So, if we assume that elasticity is isotropic, okay, which means properties do not vary from point to point and they are identical in all the directions. So, homogeneous and they are Another condition is properties are are homogeneous, which means they do not vary from point to point. In such a situation, I can write that if you know these out of these four, if you know two properties, rest can be worked out and the relations are k is equal to E divided by 3 into 1 minus 2 new. So, if you know Poisson's ratio, if you know the elastic modulus, you can work out what the bulk modulus is. Then, if you, you can determine G, G is equal to E divided by 2 into 1 plus nu. This is the second relation. So, if you know elastic modulus and Poisson's ratio, you can work out K and G. And of course, if you know this, uh, you can replace E, if you combine the two equations, rearrange it, you can find out what nu is in terms of elastic modulus and shear modulus, this is the third relations. So, these are three fundamental relations that we obtain for different materials. Okay. So, now, now what we do is that, we just go a little bit further into isotropic elasticity and close it. So, basically what we said that isotropic material has same properties in all directions. Okay. Now, let us say you take a piece of material this is x direction, this is y direction and you apply uh, a uniaxial. So, let us take a bar in this case and you apply let us say a stress in x direction. So, let us say a uniaxial tension tensile stress tensile stress. So, if you apply tensile stresses stresses sigma x, then strain can be given as E x, which can be written as sigma x divided by E. Okay. So, here E is the Young's modulus, sigma x is the tensile strain in x direction sigma x. All right. Now, if you apply your uniaxial stress, what will happen is that the material will deform which means you will have strain in this direction, you will have lateral strain. So, not only you will have strain in this direction, you will have lateral strain. So, let us see what lateral strains are. So, lateral strains will be in y direction as well as in z direction. So, if you have a three dimensional piece of material like this, so let us say this is z if that is the case, then you will have strain in all the three directions. You will have E y, which is equal to E z will be equal to minus of nu E x. So, this nu is basically Poisson's ratio. All right. So, assume that now, suppose uh, supposing that strain 
E x is produced by a stress state and the stress state is defined as three components sigma x, sigma y and sigma z. So, contribution of sigma x is essentially E x okay, which is equal to sigma x divided by E. Similarly, we have these contributions of so we saw that E x is equal to so let us just rub it out just one second. So, when you have this E x we said is equal to sigma x divided by E. So, E y will be equal to minus of nu into uh, E y will be equal to sigma y divided by E and E z will be equal to minus of nu um, sigma z divided by uh, sorry E y is equal to minus E x which is minus of E x divided sigma x divided by E and E z will be equal to sigma x divided by E. So, you can also correlate this to sigma uh, you can you can also write it in this this fashion that E x is equal to we have said that E y and E z is equal to minus of nu E x you can write a little differently. So, so if you have these relations E x is equal to sigma x by E E y is equal to sorry let me just rephrase this. So, when you have a sigma x causing a strain of sigma E x which is equal to sigma x divided by E the corresponding stresses sigma y and sigma z. So, we have sigma y and sigma z they will give rise to contractions right. So, this sigma x causes extension. So, corresponding contributions from sigma i sigma y and sigma z will be the contractions. So, in that case we can write E x as minus of V mu nu sigma y divided by E and we can write E, y, e x again as minus of nu sigma z divided by E. So, contribution of sigma y and sigma z. So, sigma y sigma, sigma x is causing extension whereas, sigma y and sigma z are causing constra, contractions and these contractions can be uh, represented as uh, E x being equal to minus of nu into E y. So, basically this is sigma y divided by E this is E y and E x will be equal to minus correspondingly this will be E z this is correct now. Okay. So, now if this is true, so if you combine all these contractions we get an equation which is E x is equal to 1 over E into sigma x minus nu into sigma y plus sigma z. So, let me say that this is let us say the extension, this is the contraction. So, the net uh, deformation or strain will be equal to. So, we can say that this is 1, this is 2, this is 3. Okay. So, basically we are saying that it is E x is equal to uh, E x 1 plus E x 2 plus E x 3 and when you sum these together this is what you get. So, the net E x is equal to 1 over E into sigma x minus nu into sigma y plus sigma z. So, now shear strains are so this is this form is basically called as general form of Hooke's law. All right. And since shear strains are are affected uh, only by 
uh, shear stresses, we can write gamma y z equal to tau y z divided by g, which is nothing but 2 e y z. And if we apply this to all directions, we can write this the above equation. So, we have this relation, we have this relation. If we apply it to all the directions, we can create a framework for all the three directions, which we will do in the next class. So, basically what we have done in this lecture is we have understood, we have first went into um, defining the elastic properties. So, we saw that elastic behavior of metals or ceramics, crystalline solids is generally uh, up to very small strain showing a linear region uh, from which you can calculate what the modulus of elasticity is because the slope is modulus of elasticity, slope of stress versus strain. But there is a nonlinear region shown by a molecular material such as polymers and rubbers. The relation between stress and strain in elastic region, linear region can be represented by Hooke's law which is sigma is equal to, so this is Hooke's law. which is sigma is equal to E e, you can write this in tensorial form modulus elasticity being the fundamental property of material. Then we looked at four more properties which are fundamental properties Young's modulus, shear modulus, bulk modulus and Poisson's ratio and then we saw the difference between the three properties, all the four properties. We are trying to deal a little bit into details of isotropic elasticity and we are on our way to define relations for the relations that we have seen in previous pages. So, what we have come up with when you apply it in silo stress correspondingly you have compressive stresses in other directions. So, there is a next uh, one strain one, one stress cause extension other stresses cause contraction as a result we have a net deformation which is given as the uh, 1 over E into sigma x minus of nu sigma y plus sigma z. So, you can see that this is the net stress that material experiences giving rise to net elongation. Similarly, you can write expression for shear stresses, we will do this in detail in the next lecture. Thank you.